Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Science Faction. The only show where a scientist, a comedian, and a comedian scientist come together to discuss science. Comedically. Hello, and welcome to Science Faction 481. Science Faction, HIV 650 million, human immune system, one. Damn it, I wish I had placed some odds on that. Damn it, we finally got HIV? We, that was like, like take that, Harlem Globetrotters. <laughs> Vegas pays $65 million to one on those odds. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, I, it would be great if there were just like a Madison Square Garden full of a quote-unquote fighters, but it was just a bunch of people getting darted with HIV and seeing which one of them could beat it without any drugs. <laughs> it's an incredibly long sport. You could say that HIV is the Harlem Globetrotter of viruses versus <laughs> us, or you could say that the Harlem Globetrotters are the HIV of beating the generals. Curly might have something to say about all that. <laughs> <laughs> and speaking of the curly of this show, I, of course, am your host, comedian archaeologist Robert Timothy, and with me, as always, is my comedian, Mr. Damien Mercado. Damien, how are you doing this afternoon? I am doing... Very poorly. It is hot. It is so hot. <laughs> it's not even that hot. What's funny is the heat wave broke like a week ago. It was actually rather, rather cool. Yeah, it, it actually has been cool all day. I just was putting up a heavy bag because um, I'm taking boxing. I'm, I'm learning yeah. to punch stuff. Good job, buddy. I'd, I'd like to say something positive. Like, hey, fans out there, uh, I recently have uh, taken some time in this quarantine. I started running. I'm a big guy. And by big, I mean mm -hmm. fat. Yes. And I've been... Uh, and also nose big. Yeah, and also nose big. Yeah. What would you say is more defining? I wouldn't say the, the, like, the nose is more defining as much as it is like um, uh, offensive. Okay, that's good. That's, <laughs> the FCC has uh, said I can't be on screen. My nose is simply too phallic. They'd have to actually digitize... Yeah, they made a rule that you were allowed to be on screen, uh, assumingly that any scene where you were in a bed, you had to have at least one foot on the ground. Yeah. Anyhow, so for some reason, I've done some running and I felt better about myself. And I don't know. <laughs> uh, I don't know why I've needed that. But uh, it's it's been a wonderful confidence booster. And suddenly it kind of feels like I haven't run at all again. Weirdly. Uh, yeah. yeah, weird. <laughs> but you know what? We'll sort that out during I Call BS. <laughs> All right. And keep in mind, guys, we will soon be launching our Patreon. We hope we can count on you guys to uh, join in there. And we're going to do a lot of kind of like inside stuff because we, we've we been talking about it a little bit. And I realized in my extensive research on this, one of the cool things about having a Patreon group is, and we mentioned this a little bit before, we can have more direct contact with the fans because it kind of allows us to have a group of people that were like, hey, these guys are supporting the show. We might as well hang out with them. And two... Uh, it allows us to turn I Call BS, which is the one that's going to be our Patreon-only episode, into something that's a little bit more out there, because we know you're our fans. Like, you're, you're going to be giving us some money to get it, so you obviously like what we're doing, so Damien can do more of his offensive nose jokes. And, uh, you know, we can and just Those are our jokes. You can't make them. Those are our jokes. Like, to some extent, the main show has to be accessible to everybody because we want to promote science and scientific learning and science education, everything like that. And so to some extent, we might have to tone that down a little bit to make it more uh, appealing to the general populace. But that means we can go buck wild with I Call BS. So I'm actually looking forward to this transition. As we do so, you're going to see that I Call BS and the main show very separate a lot. If you like that side, that separation side, then please come, uh, come join us on our Patreon because you will be getting something different. You will also be getting some sweet swag. We're going to have some Zoom just fuck around times with our with some of our Patreon people. So we look forward to uh, starting that up, having more interaction with the fans, having Zoom interactions and fun, and uh, even pretty soon bringing some science guest hosts back on the show. So uh, check that out. Really excited. That's going to be coming in just a few weeks now. So uh, it's been months in the making. Pretty excited that that's finally, uh, finally coming to fruition. I can't wait to set myself to Terry Gross mode radio audio mode uh when we when we do our regular show and then i can right. turn it off again when we do i call ps terry gross and terry grosser <laughs> i i find that joke inappropriate this is damien gross <laughs> and damien grosser would probably be laughing hysterically at that but uh, damien gross that's there's a line robert there's a line <laughs> we like to respect it here on science faction oh let's get right on to science articles from molecules to particles this is science articles this is my favorite part i hope we cover some more archaeology articles there some of my favorite bobby 
Jesus Christ, everyone, everyone notice how sexy Terry Gross sounds? <laughs> I mean... <laughs> <laughs> there's one, there's, I swear to God, I've never been into accents. I always never really found them sexy. I always thought it was weird that other people found them sexy until I listened to, like, randomly out of all the accents, a, a super sexy Irish accent on NPR. And now I, I can't stop thinking about Irish women. Really, because, I mean, I'm, growing up, you were always, whereas every other white kid in America circa the 2000s, late 90s, said they were Irish because for some reason it was cool. I was always just a, a, a Latino guy who looked white. You know? Sure. Uh, so I really didn't claim anything. But right. know, I was always surprised because you actually were Irish, but you we were have, the guy yeah. who, who denied your Irish heritage yeah. because yeah, you no. were like, no, I'm not claiming those drunk bastards. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. In fact, I was so against uh, claiming Irish heritage that uh, whenever I had friends like you, by the way, who would have a, a brother or a sister that was born within one year of them, instead of referring to them as Irish twins, I would refer to them as freedom twins. <laughs> that aged well. By the way, uh, claiming the Hungarian side, really weird. Like, you know, Ireland's <laughs> a very progressive country now. Ireland <laughs> has, has wonderful COVID numbers. Yeah. You know. uh, Hungary uh, said Nazis are cool. Yeah, I, well, I don't know that they said they were cool. I think they just said, like, please don't shoot us. But either way, I don't claim either one of them. I'm a fucking American, man. I don't, <laughs> I don't know about yeah. all these. I always find it funny when people are, like, super excited about the shitty country they came from. Yeah. I was like, I was like, my mom left as a refugee because uh, they literally caught her on a Soviet death list. They put my grandfather in a Soviet death list, and they had to leave with the clothes on their back in the middle of the night to avoid being shot in the street. You know why? Because that place sucks. Like, you know where it's cool? <laughs> We have sweet ass beaches, and nobody has tried to shoot me in the streets. I'm not black, and there's not a lot of cops around. But like, but regardless, nobody has dragged me out to the streets to try and shoot me. I'm gonna be about this country, not the place we had to flee to get to this country. And I've always felt very similarly, and perhaps it's because I am a white Latino who makes Emilio Estevez look like Cesar Chavez. <laughs> yeah. And so I, I never like could. I always felt like. Like if I always like felt self conscious, like I if I would ever be proud of like things people came who came before me who I've never met have done or perhaps right. didn't do, there might be an actual Latino person taking offense <laughs> to just just look at me and be like, "Who is this weirdo?" Yeah, it's especially bad when uh, somebody starts speaking in Spanish and you turn to me and ask what they're saying, which has happened before. <laughs> yeah, I know. All right, let's get on to these articles we haven't even talked about. Article number one, HIV 65 million, human immune system one. Uh, oh, that's right. We were doing science articles. Oh, okay. Um, oh, yeah. Tell us how we finally beat HIV. And was this a fluke or can we do it again? Was this just uh, a lucky haymaker? Yeah, just a random shot when, when HIV wasn't looking. So we've talked about <laughs> HIV before. Obviously, virus transmits and causes AIDS. One of the problems with HIV, it's a retrovirus, meaning it, it actually inserts some of its genetic material into your genome, which is why we essentially can't get rid of it. Same thing happens with herpes. It's why people get herpes for life or HIV for life, etc., even if they can get it under control. Well, uh, we have reviewed on this show before the very first time they ever permanently cured, cured HIV, which was somebody called the Berlin patient. That was somebody, ironically, an American who, you know, again, HIV is attacking your white blood cells, your T cells. And and when it attacks them, it binds to them and kills them. And then the problem is your immune system essentially dies out and you have nothing to protect yourself with. And then a cold comes around and kills you. But there are some people who naturally, they just don't have the same binding site on the elements of their immune system. And so HIV can't infect them. It's a small percentage of the overall population, large percentage in certain areas like Northern Europe. So what a doctor did in Berlin is they had a patient who had essentially a form of leukemia, a form of cancer that affected both his I think it, I think he might have actually had a bone marrow cancer, but regardless, he needed a bone marrow transplant. He just needed it for the cancer that he had. Well, this doctor decided to choose a donor who was somebody who was naturally immune to HIV. Now, this guy also had an HIV infection. So he gave this HIV slash cancer patient, he gave him a bone marrow transplant from somebody who was immune to HIV. And then basically that bone marrow is what produces white blood cells. And so he has immune bone marrow producing immune cells and then all of a sudden that guy had indetectable levels of hiv in his system because the hiv had nothing to bind to yeah yeah it was very good it was uh this was a miracle it saved my life um uh, again an I, american <laughs> yeah oh no i do this I, I now live in berlin and i do oh, this I accent to offend people because i'm actually a huge asshole 
So oh, this okay. is just part of what I... Yeah, so I That's act- funny. I was going to say uh, random uh, American doing a fake Berlin accent that it did have a twinge of Russian in it. Da. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I came out to Germany uh, to to I stayed for life saving surgery and then you know stayed to run a legal dog fighting ring and horse sex farm. You know, I'm just glad that life saving surgery was given to me and not you know some child or something. Can I ask you what in the world are you doing on that horse sex farm to make it illegal? I mean, given Germany's laws regarding horse sex farms, what do you like? Is it are they underage horses? <laughs> this interview is over. <laughs> Are the horses on anal nitrate poppers? As he's being hauled away by police right now. <laughs> we got him. Thanks, Science Faction. This is a German police. Oh, this is German police. Thank you, Science Faction, for working with the shows. This was a months long sting. We finally got that dirty horse fucker. Underage horse fucker. <laughs> Just producing massive amounts of illegal horse Viagra. <laughs> Not anymore, he isn't. He will face German jail. And now he will lose the market to Horsey Alice. <laughs> he will serve six months in a medium security German prison, which is the higher standard of living than most people live in the United States. <laughs> the downside is that like most jails, you know how instead of like a, a mirror that's made out of glass, they have to do that like that stainless steel mirror so that the guys don't break the glass and cut themselves. Uh, there's a similar thing with the uh, traditional German scatological coffee table. <laughs> scatological that's feces right that's i'm hearing that normally right? there's a glass coffee table oh in yes German house <laughs> that yes, co- is designed to be for poo sex games and unfortunately in the prison system they can't afford to have the glass it's a it's a liability and so they have to just have shiny metal ones and it's just not nearly as effective it's, it's polyurethane they could i mean there's there's workarounds you could do <laughs> <laughs> those, German, those Germans know how to engineer. Give them that. <laughs> and this is the type of comedy you won't be hearing when our Patreon goes into <laughs> yeah, effect exactly. during the regular articles. <laughs> exactly. We'll, say, we'll save all the good poo stuff for the later, for I Call it BS. So that was the first guy who got cured. They later cured a second person basically using the same procedure. It's very expensive, somewhat risky. You know, it's not exactly a cure-all, but it has worked. It's a proof of concept. Now, now that's not to be confused with people who are what are called elite controllers. Elite controllers can be infected by the virus, so these aren't these people who don't have the same binding sites, but they seem to keep the virus completely under control, essentially at undetectable levels, without any drugs, indefinitely. This is a very small percentage of the population, it's like less than half of a percent, but basically they get infected, and yet, for one reason or another, their body's immune system is able to keep this in check. So they did a study of these elite controllers and they thought what's going on here maybe you remember you know viruses are constantly replicating themselves maybe there was some mistakes we know that happens maybe these people got like a jacked version of the virus they got a bunk copy of hiv so their body's able to control it because the virus is fucked up so they did a test of the genetics of the hiv strains within elite controllers and just normal population and they found there was essentially no difference it's not that it's not that they have a bad copy However, they did notice something, and this really cracked open like a, the, the potential for future HIV research. So this is straight from Science Daily, because I wanted to make sure I got it right. So most people infected with HIV, the virus lands near or in the genes. Again, it's in putting it into your genome, into your DNA in order to hide in there. In most people infected with HIV, the virus lands in or near the genes thanks to some human proteins that shepherd it, shepherd it there. But in elite controllers, the virus was trapped in gene-poor parts of the human genetic instruction book or genome. When it did land in or near the genes, they were ones that are wrapped in the molecular equivalent of razor wire, which prevent the genes from being turned on. So could this just be luck? Like in these particular individuals, the virus is getting deposited in a part of the genome that is not particularly dangerous. And it's just by random chance or luck. It could be. That could be possible. Now, we do know that at least 25% of elite controllers have some kind of mutations in their immune system. We don't know quite what it does, but it hints that there is something going on there. That's only 25%, though. Maybe the other 75% are just random luck, right? Maybe this is what's going on. We're not 100% sure. It could literally just be luck, or there could be a part of the elite controller's immune systems that essentially eliminate cells producing functional virus, making sure that the only ones left are the non-functional virus, 
and the intact versions that are locked in, you know, those states where they can't get out. How this happens, we're not sure. But if that's the case, then maybe we can find a way to artificially do this. Maybe this is even the hint at how to do a vaccine. If you can get the, this virus or an inactivated part of this virus to the right part of the genome, you can essentially produce the antibodies without uh, danger of, uh, of infection. That's a really interesting concept. It is really neat. And this is one of those kind of foundational studies that... We're probably not going to see anything directly out of this, but the studies that are going to come out of this may well be the HIV vaccine or HIV treatments or possibly even an HIV cure. This is a very, very interesting study that kind of showed us a really big piece of the puzzle. And it's usually through these weird edge cases, these people who are able to fight off the virus on their own, that we're able to derive a way to help better fight the virus because we can replicate what they're already naturally doing. We have something we know works. So in looking at all these people, they found at least one guy who had no functional copies of the virus. Some of these guys have been infected for as long as 24 years. The average mean was about 10 years. This guy had no functional copies of the virus. He was not on any of the antiretroviral drugs. A second guy, he had only one functional copy, but it was again in part of the genome that would essentially keep it locked down so it wasn't very accessible. So both of those guys are essentially functionally self-cured of it, or at least in control. Maybe the virus can spring up and produce copies later on, but for now, everything's in control. That virus is completely held in control and there are no drugs involved. That's really cool. And if we can figure out how they can do it, maybe we can figure out how to induce that change in other people. Maybe it just has to do with certain protein signaling functions. You know, some proteins are letting out something and it's not allowing the virus to replicate in those people. And if we can just mimic that in normal, healthy people, then we have a cure or a treatment or something for HIV. Really, really cool study. Totally flew under the radar. Good news, affluent Americans afflicted with HIV. A big step was made in helping you with your now minor inconvenience. Well, actually, if you think about it, the affluent people are the ones who have it the easiest, because right now they can afford all the retroviral drugs that essentially make HIV a livable condition. It's the people who are in really impoverished scenarios for which, like, cures and vaccines are really important, because they can't afford everyday treatment. They can't afford 20 pills a day, and they have a hard lifestyle, and their immune system's already compromised, so, like, they're the ones whom treatments, cures, that kind of thing really will have the bigger effect. Well, poor people, you know, have plenty of access to health care, so I'm sure they'll be distributed. Sure, sure. It will take a while to filter down to them, but in the end, still is still good. All right, our clumber two, she's a bad bitch. What do you say about my dog? Uh, this is actually about hyenas. This is another really interesting story that, again, flew under the radar. This one, more understandably, just interesting to me, not necessarily super crazy science groundbreaking, but really interesting. So, real quick review on mammals. In general, in mammals, the males are bigger if there's a significant sexual dimorphism, sometimes very big. Why is that? Uh, Competition. Okay. Yeah, we're, we're constantly competing with one another to see who can be the bigger one to try and mate with the females. And so that's at least, you know, the, the natural selection version of it. And is there an advantage to the half of the species that carries, that gestates life to not be out, I don't know, to, to not be the one who has to protect against yeah, the Yeah, think about it. So, like, if you're the female lion, you're not com you're not usually competing for male lions, right? The male lion lions are competing for you because one male can impregnate many females, but one female can only get impregnated by one male, right? And so to you, you want to be selective of who you breed with. To the males, you want to breed with as many females as possible. And the way you do that is by being bigger than the other dude because then you get, you know, if there's two dudes and two chicks and one dude is way bigger, then it's not, you know, one's mating with one. It's one guy's mating with two chicks and one guy's shit out of luck. And one awesome fucking night. But, okay, then what are the dynamics that lead to hyenas as you were building? Well, those? right. So so in general, uh, like if things like male lions, a male lion will come into a pride. He's usually transient. He comes in, takes over, beats the shit out of whatever resident male lion has been head of that pride. Then now he's the head. And one of the first things he does is kill all the cubs. Now, he does that because he wants to send the females back into estrus and they go back into estrus quicker or they can be impregnated quicker if they are not nursing a cub. And it's not his genetic lineage. He wants his genetic lineage to live. And to do so, if he kills off these lions, they have a better chance. So that's what he does. And that's pretty common with males in the animal kingdom. I think dolphins do it. A bunch of other animals do it. This really interesting study just came out about how hyenas. And it's the opposite. It's the mothers that are killing cubs. Now, just like the lions, they're not killing their own cubs. They're killing the cubs of other members of their pack. But again, this isn't a rival pack. This is their own pack. Sometimes close relatives like nieces and nephews. Really, really interesting because this is not something you would naturally think of as being genetically advantageous. So let's go over the research. Maybe those were just really bad cubs. 
they were the annoying ones. Or maybe he's little. They can sense psych- psychopathy amongst <laughs> their kind really well. Well, first, let's start how how this happens. So the way hyenas give birth, the mother gives birth in her own particular den, just her and her cubs. But then shortly thereafter, they move to a communal den with the whole pack. It's there that these murders happen, and it's by rival female mothers. Sometimes it'll be either an aunt coaxing their nephews and nieces out and then crushing their skull real quick. That's how they kill them. Well, the researchers saw this and they're like, this is not what we usually see with female mammals. This is really weird. What could be the advantage of this? We already know from certain genetics principles that there is a kin selection pressure to make your nieces and nephews survive. Like it is to my advantage for my brother or my sister's kids to grow up and mate because they pass on a certain amount of my genes. So like there's actually a mathematical calculation where my kid will have 50% of my genes, my nephew or niece will have 25% of my genes, which means theoretically, if I had a choice between my kids surviving and three of my nephews and nieces surviving, I should choose three of my nephews and nieces and my genes will spread better that way. I will have 75% of my genes flowing on instead of 50. Go home and tell that to your wife. Yes, I know. I, I, I understand that. But I'm just saying there is a strong pressure to preserve these nieces and nephews and these types of kids. So in, is, genetically speaking, this does not make a lot of sense. Biologically speaking, this does not make a lot of sense. So this, is our, this started them thinking and wondering what was going on. They started observing what was happening. Maybe they got really hungry, they thought. But they looked, and only 11 out of the 21 killed pups were eaten, and it didn't seem to correlate with, like, times of shortages of food or something. It was really, it wasn't for the food. So it wasn't that. They did notice that it was always higher status females killing the cubs of lower status females. So it wasn't like somebody is jumping up and killing the rich kid. It's always the rich kid's moms killing the poor kids. Like, hey, if I'm sorry, sis. My niece is a nerd. Yeah. I gotta correct that shit. They think what it is is an assurance of the female bloodline, because here is why hyenas are different, and this is kind of what you were hinting at. Hyenas are the only mammal that we know of in which the females are the larger, more dominant of the species. Females are larger than the males in hyenas. They even have an enlarged, like, six-inch clitoris that from the outside looks like a giant penis. So if you're at the zoo and you see a big-ass hyena with a big-ass penis, it's probably a girl. Although I we live close to the San Diego Zoo and there is Arturo, the massively hung hyena. And yes, that's, that's true. That's all Wang. He drags it behind him. You know what the female hyenas say? Once you go Arturo, you're never laughing again. <laughs> <laughs> He's choked more hyenas. <laughs> Again, tune into I Call BS for this <laughs> hyena cock comedy that you've desired. Yeah, I had the choice to not do that joke, but I thought, you know what? The line's going to be drawn soon. Get yeah. it in. Just get, get it in. Get it in. Something Arturo has a big problem with. So maybe this dominance of females means that the insurance of the female bloodline has to be maintained the same way it's done with male lions, which is you kill the ones that aren't your direct offspring when you come into a place and you try and ensure your side survives. That's a really interesting like change of population dynamics, likely based on the fact that women control that society. It's very, very interesting. It's, like, it's, it's almost like the roles have completely flipped. So whenever a matriarch does this, she's just ensuring that her daughter is going to be mm-hmm. the, the, the next queen. Yeah, she's, that's what she's trying. That's the idea. Uh, yeah. It's okay. So there's just a lot of Cersei Lannisters yes. in the hyena yes. community, people who are not afraid to uh, plumb the family tree. And of course, there was that one big dumb hyena called uh, Ho Dog Door. <laughs> yeah, he had a laugh uh, that was very distinctive. <laughs> Just one note over and over again. <laughs> Fucking spoiler alert. Ho Dog Door has a very tragic origin story. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, fate's going to basically mentally disable you. Just make you a deus ex machina for, you know, uh, an event 30 years in your fucking future. It's interesting to, to figure this out. And I don't know if we ever will, but it would be interesting to figure out if this was a chicken or an egg thing in terms of the hyenas, right? Like, did they get bigger first? And then because of that size advantage over the males, did they then adopt this type of society in which infanticide was common among uh, the females of the pack, even though that's not usually the case in mammals? Or was it the reverse? Did, did like a cultural thing evolve where the females started selectively taking out 
the other cubs of the other females, and then somehow that impacted the size and, and they got bigger and bigger. Who knows? But super, super interesting. I always love these weird anomalies in evolution, these weird quirks. They tell us so much about how the rules work and how they bend and break and stuff. It's really, really neat. So male hyenas do not compete for female hyena attention? Not like, in are the... they more hunted and then mated with yes. against their will? It's a lot like those like Amazon fantasies you had when you were 12. Yeah. Uh, you know what? There's enough of that on the other side in nature. It's about time. It's about time one species broke the mold and committed unspeakable sexual acts to males for once. Yeah, you shatter that mold with a throbbing six-inch clit. All right. Thank you, audience, for joining us for Science Faction 481, where you learned all about the first human to ever beat HIV without drugs and how hyenas are bad bitches. Thank you so much for joining us, and come on back later this week for Science Faction 482. Hi, yes, Damien Gross here. I want to assure you that uh, once I take over the show, throbbing hyena clitoris will not be spoken of again. You've been listening to Science Faction. Wait, that's not right. Mm-hmm.